You ready? God's doing big things. You ain't seen nothing yet. Bump, bump. Bump, bump. Bump, bump, baby. Hey, I believe that through the word of God this morning, we're, we're, we're going to stay in Matthew. Last, last week we talked about Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to say, look at that, it just happened. Last week I said, if we flip my Bible open, and then I flipped it open and it didn't go to it, I just flipped it open and it went to it. Matt, we were in Matthew chapter 6, it just happened. Just a week late. Um, you can't make that up. I believe, uh, we, we're, we're, we're going to be right here in Matthew, and we're actually going to go in Matthew chapter 4 and 5 this morning. And I just believe what's going to happen in here is we're going to see things differently than you saw things be- when you came in. We're going to see things because, the, and, and it's not like, I've got something for you. Jesus has something for you. And the Holy Spirit's going to be your good teacher this morning. Amen? We're going to read the red letters of the Bible, and we're going to watch it come alive as Jesus challenges us down to the core. When Jesus teaches, it, does never, it never leaves me comfortable. It leaves me changed. And so I just believe he's going to do that this morning. I believe he's got hope for the hopeless. I believe there's breakthrough that when you came in and it was like, man, I was weighed down by the circumstances of my life. And yet I received a word from God and that, that burden is lifted and you can see the kingdom of God in your life in new ways. You can see what God is doing instead of what the, the trial and tribulation, the circumstances you're going through. I believe that Jesus is so powerful that he can change your situation, but I believe that it's more powerful that he can change you before, the, before you even see the situation change. There's a steadiness that come in, can come in you. The fact that the sto- like when Jesus calmed the storm, that was cool, but the steadiness that you can have in the middle of the storm, that's the gift I want. Regardless of whatever is going through in life, I, I, I want that gift to be able to go through and see Jesus through the whole thing. And no, man, he sent me out here. He's not, he didn't send me out here to die. So God's going to, I believe that there's a kingdom perspective that's going to be poured out. The title of today's message is, it's time to see things differently. It's time to see things differently. We guys just open up your hands as big as you can and just repeat after me. You're like, man, we re- repeat a lot of things in this church. Yeah. It's because we're, we're, we're going after shift and change. And it happens when you align your, your voice with the voice of the Lord. And so just, just say this, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Just say, Jesus, you are welcome here. Yeah, just touch your heart. God is big, but he's also personal. And just say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Yeah, Jesus, you are welcome here. God, your way of doing things, your love, your kingdom, everything you've got, it's welcome here. In Jesus' name, amen. Might be the most powerful thing you've done all morning. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus offers a new perspective to your current circumstances. Anybody want a new perspective? Anybody want to see it through Jesus' eyes? Before we get to Matthew chapter 5, that's just a little teaser. You got to see Matthew chapter 4. I was preparing, and really I just wanted to stick in Matthew chapter 5, but I got distracted. Anybody get distracted by the Word of God? I got distracted and started daydreaming about Jesus out in the wilderness. And I want to just show you some things because I think you have to see chapter 4 before you can move into the promises of chapter 5. Jesus had to go through chapter 4 before he could lead people into the promises of chapter 5. And so I want want to show you this. If you take a step back to Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. It says this, that Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Yeah, I'd be hungry too. Aren't you glad the Bible just tells you how it is? What's imp- what I saw here differently than I'd ever seen before is Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. I believe God wants to renew a revelation of what the wilderness is. We, we, it, wilderness is a term that the, the world doesn't know, the church uses. And we just say, I'm just going through a wilderness season. But a lot of times we use that for like the voice of God or the presence of God or the connection with God is distance. But I want to show you, and and 
I would just challenge you, show me in the word where that kind of wilderness season exists because when Jesus was led into the wilderness, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and he was satisfied by the Spirit. He was, he, he, why was he led there? He was led there to fast 40 days. He was disconnecting from the world and connecting with his Father more than ever before. Even Jesus was able to do that and we see it in, the, in, in um, we see it in the story of the Israelites and they're delivered from their slavery in Egypt. And where do they go? They got to go through the wilderness to get to the promised land. So God led them out of slavery, out of bondage, into the promised land. And in the journey is the wilderness. But what I see there is the presence of God was so apparent like they had never been in Egypt. When you're going through your wilderness, it's not without God. It's with God more than ever. The revelation that I'm seeing in this is the Spirit's leading you into more of Him, and your promises are only right around the corner. Your promised land is right around the corner, and yet we sit and it's just like, eh, it's just so hard, and it's like, no, listen, if you're, if you're in a place where you're disconnected, and it's not a wilderness season, you don't have to stay in that place. Man, I just, my strength, my, 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 my worship just isn't the same. Well, just ask God to change that. Don't stay in that place of that's a wandering, and when we wander, we don't have vision, and we're, we're liable to get picked off. If anybody's ever watched the animal channel, you, you very rarely see a herd of people or a herd of animals attacked. You never see a herd of people. <laughs> that would be a good channel, though. I might renew my cable subscription for that. <laughs> a pack of Chiefs fans are being attacked. Next Sunday on... <laughs> oh, no, that's just Tom Brady taking... Okay. Um, man, know your audience. Um, you don't see... Thank you for that. You don't see a pack get attacked. You see the one who's wandering by themselves, who's off a little bit, who's exploring on their own. And it's a, Now, sometimes God will call you into that. Do you hear me? Sometimes God will lead you away from the pack for a short time into his promises. Jesus was led away for a short time, and he was hungry, according to the word, for a short time, but he went back, and then he began to assemble his pack like never before. He walked into his ministry. The Israelites were only meant to be wandering for a short time. They were only meant to be, they were never meant to be wandering. They were only meant to be on a short journey, and yet they got to a place where they started to doubt God along the way from their delivery to their promised land, and it created a wandering place. That's not the wilderness that God led them to. But he will never, get this, the word of, because emotionally, we want to reconcile our wilderness season. But the word says he will never leave you nor forsake you. There's not a land that exists. There's not a period in your life where the presence of God isn't meant to be thick in your life when, now that you've accepted Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. Well, I just can't. No, you don't stay in a place where you can't hear his voice. You stand and you fight and you move and you change and you get in the word and you ask him. Even better than striving, you just say, God, give me that hunger for you again. Let me hear your word more clearly. Show me what I need to remove in my life do you, you understand this, that we're not called as Christians to be wanderers. We're called to be purpose-driven. And even if the wilderness is in your life, I'm not doubting there's wilderness seasons, but that wilderness season is not without God. God is with you more than ever before. The wilderness, okay, I've like gotten out of my notes. You, l l I want to remind you of this. This is really powerful. Your emotions are not the word of God. Your circumstances are not the word of God. Your feelings are not the word of God. Here's a big one. Your experiences are not the word of God. The word of God is the word of God, and only the word of God is truth. And so we have to let every experience and every emotion and every feeling and every circumstance come under the truth of God. Can you guys do that? And, 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 and here's where the enemy wants to win. is like, but, but not this one. Oh, it's not going to work out for you. Oh, they're not going to, that, that prayer is not going to get answered. Oh, it's not going to, let me just tell you, that's, you, you have to submit that to the truth of God. Show me in the word. Turn to the person next to you and say, show me in the word. This isn't a cocky thing you say to people to like get them stumbling. This is about, 
This is what you say to the enemy when he lies to you. And he does it really good. And we sit sometimes in our, we sit sometimes in it. And we start to agree with them. Maybe my life doesn't have value. Maybe I would be better off. Maybe they'd be better off. Maybe, maybe if I could just, and, and we start to agree with the low value position of the enemy on your life. But God, the word of God doesn't say any of that about you. He's closer than a brother. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's good news. I'm not moved by anything. Let's not be moved by anything other than God's word. Amen? We need to change our boo-hoo, stinking thinking about the wilderness season. And if you're in a wilderness season, say hoorah. Wait a second. I'm in a wilderness season. You know what that means? I can see the presence of God with me at every moment. That means I'm getting prepared for the promises of God. That means the giants that are in front of me, I'm going to be so built up that I'm going to boldly say, that's our land and it's time for you to move. That means I'm going to, here's what it means. It means everything you need in life is provided to you through the Holy Spirit. Tiff and I got married, and that was amazing for me. I'm like, she really said yes. This is like signed, sealed, and delivered. And the second most amazing thing happened to me, we went to Hawaii 24 hours later. We got on a boat, and it was like a floating hotel on a Norwegian cruise, and we went from island to island. And every day, we'd be at a different island, and we'd get off. I was on a journey. I just signed up. We showed up. We actually, like, we, we, we showed up, we get on the boat, we get in our room, but everything else is taken care of. I can have food whenever I want, and I did. <laughs> There's entertainment whenever you want. We didn't do much of that. You can get off the boat when, you're, when, when you want to, but you can get back on the boat. And everything, as long as you were on the boat, everything was free. Everything on the boat was free. As long as you were in the presence of God, everything is taken care of. This, this like lack, lack in your life, that exists as you start to back out of the promises of God in your life. As you start to say, no, I want the things that God doesn't want for your life. But everything, it's like, oh, God, you, you brought me to Wichita. You've got to pay for the house. You, God, you, 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 you've, you, you've brought me into this. You've got to, I'm going to say yes to you, but you're going to say yes to everything else. Because he's our provider. So when you're on this, if you're in this place where you're like, man, I'm, 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 in the, I'm just want to... I'm bringing some corrective instruction into our lives through the word of God because that's what God did for me. And I've only gone to verse one. Verse two says this. Just say, what else do you have for me, God? Matthew four, two says, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. And now when the tempter came to him, he said to him, if you were the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Fasting confuses the devil. The devil looked at him, and he, the devil can't see your spirit. He can only see your flesh. You guys have given way too much power to the devil. We, we're, we're guilty of that in the body. It's like, oh, he, he can't see what God is doing in you. He can't hear your thoughts. He can only see your flesh and submit ideas to you, okay? He looked at Jesus after spending 40 days with God and he was hungry, and he looked at his flesh, and he said, here he is, weaker, he's the weakest I've ever seen him. And the enemy evaluated him to be the weakest when he was actually the strongest. His spirit was more alive than ever. Do you see that? And so the enemy comes up to him, and it's like, oh, man, what's going to happen? The enemy is about to get his teeth knocked out. And he's got no place. This is the, listen, the Son of Man was tempted in every way that we've been tempted. He had no, he had no special exemption. There was, no, there was no tax exemption from him from this type of temptation. And so the enemy had a chance. But when the enemy evaluated him as weak, and as maybe you're in a place where your flesh feels pretty weak, you're in the middle of sickness, you're, you're going through stuff, you might be watching and you're like, Man, you, you took an at-home test and it said positive and the world's been spinning and you're not feeling well. The, the, the enemy may look at you and say, now's the perfect time. But when your flesh is weak, if you're in the presence of God, you can be stronger than ever. And in that moment, you can destroy the works of the enemy. The enemy misjudges us. 
When we crucify our flesh like Jesus did during his fast, the enemy may think we're weak, but Satan sees but when Satan sees us the most vulnerable, we are actually more alive than ever before. The word says, let the weak say, I am strong. The enemy may see you weak, but you are strong. You got, you, you got time for one more revelation out of chapter 4? Let's read verse 8 and 11. Or 8 to 11. G, this is where Jesus says, get away from me, Satan. Again, the devil took, upon him exceeding, took, took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them all these things, I will gi- I, he said to them, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. There's a whole teaching in the angels coming and ministering to Jesus. Every one of his needs were met. And after, he, after he, he got through his victorious battle, God nourished him. That was the end of the fast for him. But what I want you to see is this. The enemy is still doing this same type of temptation today. The enemy came to Jesus and he said, you're meant to rule over the world. That is your purpose. I've got a shortcut and it's not a difficult path, and you won't have to kill yourself. You won't have to die. You won't have to be crucified. You won't have to go through the pain and the anguish. You won't even have to mess with those filthy humans and build, like, you can just worship me, and I'll give you the earth. He presented the, he per, and made perverse what was the purposes of God, and he presented a shortcut. The enemy is still doing this, And Jesus was so serious. Listen, he went through the other two temptations and he didn't say this, but he was so serious about this temptation that it had to be removed that I will not even give any place. Listen, God's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. And you can't give any place to the perversion of God's very best for your life. Jesus said, get away from me, Satan. For I will only walk out God's plan. The other place you see Jesus talk like this is right after he gives the greatest attaboy to Peter. In Matthew chapter 16, he, Jesus says, well, who am I? And then they say, well, you're this, well, you're that. And he says, well, who do you think I am? And, and Peter stands up and he, and he rightly calls out Jesus to be the anointed one. And then immediately after, Jesus starts teaching, okay, now if you know that I'm the anointed one, he says this. From the, that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from, el- from, from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Peter then took him as- as- aside and he began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it for you, Lord, that this shall not happen to you. But then Jesus turned to Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan. You see, Peter, in his love for this man, wa- uh, uh, didn't, didn't receive the truth of the plans of God for Jesus, and instead he wanted to find a shortcut or a way around it. God, that can't happen to you. And out of the goodness of his heart, sometimes we do this out of each, for each other. Oh, it's so hard for you. It's so, maybe, get, you know, I just want you to know you don't have to do that. No, get behind me, Satan. If God's called me to it, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it with all my might. We've got to get a little bit more passionate about the purpose of God in our lives Because Jesus isn't plain. Do you see this? This is just chapter 4. Jesus says, get behind, this is, this is his, he gave this guy a new name. Can you just imagine all that work you did to name your child, then Jesus shows up and he's like, not good enough, I got to give you this name. And you're walking with him and you just got the, it's like, man, who am I? He's like, Jesus, you're the anointed one. He's like, you're right, and upon this rock, I'll I'll prom this revelation, I'm going to build my, and then he, and then a moment later, he's like, he calls him Satan, but he wasn't speaking to Peter. He was speaking to the spirit that was in that conversation. Don't entertain it. You have to believe. We're going to see things differently, okay? The groundwork for this is God has a plan for my life. Some of you just like, not just in your spirit, you just said, not me. God has a plan for your life. You have to settle everything right there. No, God has a plan for today. God has a plan for tomorrow, and it's his, and when anybody comes up with a shortcut or a different way around that, we do this a lot. 
We take the principles of God and apply them to the, to, to, to the world and what the world wants. It's like, man, I'm just so blessed. I'm out here and look. How, and it's like, no, no, no. If, if it's not from God, you don't want it at all. But, but I, really, I really desire it. It's like, no, listen. Let me just tell you. Some of you, some of you young adults need to like, when, you, when someone slides you a DM, you need to say, get behind me, Satan. Someone reaches out to you that's not the very best for your future and, try, and says, hey, you want to you connect to this place? You want to go to this? You need to say, get behind me, Satan. Is, it too, is, it, is, it, is chapter 4 too real for you guys? It, it doesn't, you can't go to chapter 5 unless you d- d- decide in your heart. No, no, no. God's plan is the best plan. And I'm going to wait. Michael's getting married in March. And I'm sure there's been times where there's been opportunity for less than God's best presented to him. And I'm sure the world's wondered, like, and I'm sure he's wondered, like, God, you put this passion and purpose in my heart, and how is it going to happen? And and the timeline seems a little longer than it did, than I thought it was going to be. And yet, I'm telling you, your first year of marriage isn't going to be like everybody else's first year of marriage because you, you've sat and waited for the promises of God and his very best, and so you don't have to bring in the world into this. And when people say, hey, the first one's the hardest one, you just say, get behind me, Satan. Show me in the word. Can say, maybe you say it that way. Show me in the word of God where it says that, and I'll believe for it. But that's what the world's experience. That's not what God, does that make sense? Do they preach this in Las Vegas? We have to come into alignment with the purposes and passionately protect them in our lives. I just don't think it's going to happen. Some of you guys need to say this to your husbands and your wives as they're murmuring and, about the circumstances and thinking it's going to happen forever. And you need to say, hey, that's not what the Bible says about, about you. That's not what God says about you. When the enemy tempted Jesus with his significance and his future, God's perfect plan... Um, and his perfect path. When the enemy tried to say, well, God's perfect plan and that path isn't the best, Jesus said, get the heck out of here. And we need to keep going back to, man, God, you know best. You understand the situation. And I am excited about the promises and the purposes that you have for me. We don't play. Um, man, you guys want to get in chapter 5? We'll give, it, we'll give it a go. Chapter 5. Jesus is offering a new perspective to your current circumstances. I would have loved if Jesus in his first teaching would have said, if you have nothing, if you have no money, good news. The kingdom of God is here and there's a bank account and now you're rich. Okay? But it wasn't that the circumstances, Jesus didn't talk about how the circumstances would change Although the circumstances do change, his promise is that our perspective, it can now be kingdom. The message here at the beginning is the kingdom of God is now open. It, this is a message that was never able to be preached because the salvation of Jesus was never at hand. The salvation of Christ was never at hand. But now through Jesus and in his ministry, he could begin to unveil this new and better covenant that where the kingdom of God is open. And it, just imagine, the new, like, you know, if we, if, if we got an Apple store here where I could get my iPhone fixed without standing in line for four hours, that would be a great day for Wichita. And it's nothing. No, if, 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 there was a, if there was a car dealership that actually had cars on the lot, that would be, like, now open. That pales in comparison. It pales in the comparison to Jesus saying the kingdom is at hand, which when you see that, it's the kingdom is now open to you. A new perspective is now open to you. I'm going to try to stay with my notes so that we can go. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 says, Seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and when he was seated with his disciples, he came to them, and then he opened up his mouth, and he taught them, saying, and he, and, and, and he said this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't just say you're blessed like we think blessed. You almost have to like cross out that word and rewrite it because millennials have destroyed it. Just teasing. I think it was like Gen X or Gen Z. Or We've overused this word. It's like, man, how was your day? I was blessed. I didn't get in a car wreck. It was blessed. It was blessed. Let me read you the definition. When Jesus says you're blessed, he doesn't just mean you're, you're okay. 
doesn't just mean that things are going in a good direction. It says this, when you were blessed, you were spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction. You have God's favor and his salvation regardless of your outward conditions. You are happy to be envied and you are admired. So I want you just to take that into the next conversation because Jesus says this, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus is saying. If you're downtrodden, if you've been beat up, if you feel like the world has, has, has trampled on you, if you're at the end of your rope, you are blessed, spiritually prosperous. You have life joy and satisfaction. You're in God's favor salvation and have salvation regardless of your outward conditions. You're happy to be envied. That's not how it feels, Jesus. I don't know what book you're reading from or what world you just came of. I don't know what they were feeding you, the angels were feeding you in the wilderness, but that's not how it works here. He says, are you, do you feel like you're at the end of your rope and worthless, devalued, beat up, unclean, like you've, the, the, the life that you've put together is less than what you could offer to Jesus? He says, you're blessed when you're poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You're blessed because now the kingdom of heaven is open to you. You're blessed because when the things aren't working out for you in the world, I've got good news. There's a Savior right in front of you, and his name is Jesus Christ. You're blessed when things haven't worked out the way you thought they were going to, and when your value of the world runs out. As quickly as you can get to that place, get to that place, because when there's less of you, there's more of God in his reign. And he doesn't, have a, he doesn't have for you to stay in that place, but the only way he can get you into the blessing of God is for you to receive the kingdom that's now open to you. Man, Jesus is in front of you, and now that Jesus is in front of you, you don't have to stay defeated. You don't have to stay hopeless. You don't have to stay angry. You don't have to stay... The end of your rope becomes the beginning of your future. Do you see how Jesus sees this? Verse 4 says, blessed are those who mourn. Oh, Jesus, don't mess with us, for they shall be comforted. He says this, he says, this applies to those who are grieving. Jesus says, you've lost something or someone significant, you're blessed. I don't feel blessed. When I've lost something that's so dear to me, you're blessed. Why? Why? Because in that moment, you can be wrapped up by the one who's actually the most dear to you. Too many times we make possessions and things, and we bring anything in front of Jesus. We bring it, and it's just like, God, I love you, but I love this. And when, we've, when things of this world, including loved ones, are ripped from you, and you're grieving those losses, what will never be ripped from you is the love of God. It will wrap you up and it will bring you into truth and you will see God and he will show up in his favor in your life like you've never been before. And when you're desperate because you don't have that loved one in your life anymore, he is pouring out his love in all new ways. And you're going to say, God, I never knew it could be like this. So Jesus, this is Jesus. He says, you're blessed. Blessed are the morning for they will be comforted. There's confidence in the comfort of God. Verse 5 says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I heard a pastor one time says, he taught that meekness is not weakness, it's power and control. The message says it this way, you're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. Verse 6 says, blessed are the hungry, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is a promise. Are you hungry for the kingdom of God? Do you have a desire to see God move? Are you asking for more of God? Because if you're asking that question, it's the greatest thing. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew who was with you, you would ask me for living water and you would never be thirsty again. Are you hungering for the things of God? Because he's the best meal you'll ever eat. That's what the message says. If you've never read Matthew chapter 5 in the message, today is your homework. It brings it from this theological words to this like oh man god when i'm hungry for you jesus says if you're hungry for god i promise you you'll never be disappointed thank you jesus thank you god blessed are the blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy when you care for others you're gonna find yourself cared for 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. A clean heart produces a clear vision, and the passion, says, the, the passion says it like this. What bliss you experience when your heart is pure, for then your eyes will see more and more of God. There's a whole message on vision here. You guys seeing how God's just inviting you to see things from his perspective? Let him preach to you on your way home. As you leave here, don't just leave here and be like, man, that was good. I forgot what we were talking about. But write in your notes, God, show me your vision for my current circumstances. He'll say, blessed when you're building a home because you're making a, you're making a place where the kingdom will be housed forever. He'll say, blessed when you're preparing for this new covenant because you're going to experience new, co- you're going to experience new revelation on the new covenant you have for me. He's going to say, blessed when you serve and you've laid down your life to follow him without any titles, without any, if, if nobody else notices you, I notice you and you're blessed. And instead of being like, man, I've just been doing this for years and nobody, I never, yes, you're blessed. Because I, I, you're, 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 you're storing up your, your treasures in heaven and nobody from he, the earth is robbing them. I'm hiding you for, for such a time. I'm building in you. I said, well, God, I'm waiting a long time for your best. I'm, I'm about to settle on that guy down the street. I'm about to settle for that situation or that job. And, and, he, and he said, oh, you, you've waited? Blessed are those who wait, for they're going to see the promises of God. Blessed are those who go through the world, will, their wilderness journey, because the Spirit of God is going to be with them more than they've ever experienced. Man, I'm in the wilderness. I'm going to start high-fiving you. If you come and you're like, I'm like, how are you doing? It's just a wilderness season. I'll be like, "Woo! are you kidding me? You're in a wilderness season? You're seeing the Holy Spirit like smoke and fire? How do you sleep in that season? Man, do you realize the promises of God are just around the corner for you? Do you realize if you don't give up, the giants will give you their kingdom because of the God that's backing you? What do we have to be? We're building lives together to make fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That sounds real Christian. Let me just make it real easy for you. We're those that don't let each other sit in their suck. We don't let each other sit in their, in their negative view. We don't let each other sit. And it's like, it sounds really easy to be like, man, it's really sorry. I'm really sorry, Brittany. Or, or, I'm, really, I'm, re- I'm really sorry that you're going through that. I'm really sorry. And we could go through this over and over again. We could, you could look at Whitney and it's like, man, I'm really sorry. That baby doesn't want to come out of you. But let me tell you, what you don't know is she's contending for the promises of God in her life. And she wants to see it God's way, and she wants to see it on his timing. And so you can say, I'm sorry, but she's, we, we got to be those that say, man, it's going to happen just like God's promised to you. Man, God's timing and God's faithfulness to you, it's never ending and it's never running out. And you're going to see an outpouring of his love and his mercy, and it's not going to be like it has to be for everybody else. It's going to be life-changing for you. That's what building lives together is. It's not just eating next, sun, next Sunday at the meet and greet. That's the beginning so that what we can do? We're going to pull each other up and say, you may thought you were coming with mom, but you're coming for God. He's got something all new, and he's got it pointed directly at you. And he says, this is, the God, this is who I want you to see. This is the faithfulness of Jesus to your life. And it's changing, and it'll never be the same. And if you're sitting at home, you can stand up right now because the healing of God is present where you're at. Well, it's going to take 10 days, and I'm going to sit through this. I'm probably going to be weak for about a month. Show me in the Word. Show me where Jesus came up, and he's like, oh, you got COVID? Next. My name isn't above that name. No, no, I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the name above all names. And if you can name it, he sits above it. You got a word for it? I love it. Delta, Omicron, you can come out with whatever you want. You're just naming things that are lower than my Lord. So what's Jesus doing in chapter 4? He's reminding us that, man, we don't mess. We don't play around with people that will... Settle for less than God's best for your life. Some of you guys got some like, the, just don't go telling your mom, get behind me, Satan, okay? <laughs> she just wants the best for you. Save that for your best friend, 
your, your marriage, if it's really, really strong. <laughs> but in chapter 5, Jesus is so excited to say the kingdom is open to you. His perspective is open to you, and you never have to go back to that way of thinking. What are we going to do from here? And I'm going to try to land the plane. We're going to ask Jesus, God, in this circumstance. Now listen, I don't, want you to, I don't want you to think lower of him than you ought. He can change and will change the circumstance that you're in. But the, the way he's going to do it is partnering with you. And when you see yourself, Jenny Bug, when you see yourself as valuable, as loved, as, wor- as worthy, as purpose-driven, as God's got something for you, and when you see yourself that way, now you can change your circumstances. But we, part, we partner with his perspective. Quit, quit looking for CNN's perspective. Quit looking for Fox News' perspective. Joe Rogan does not have the perspective of Jesus Christ. But the word of God does. Show me in the word. Show me in the word. So this week, whatever your circumstances is, it may say I'm in debt. It may say I have, oh gosh, it's tax season again, I'm going to get hit. Well, I don't know what it is. It may say, you may be sitting in a meeting and everybody around you is confessing to be an addict and you may need to say, get behind me, Satan. Because that's not who Jesus says I am. Amen. Don't partner with less than the best of God for your life. And let his kingdom, let his kingdom give him permission to come up higher and see from his perspective. Jason Cho would say, while everybody else is playing checkers, you can see that God's playing chess. And you can see that his strategy is going to work out for you. So we're going to high-five each other when we're going through the hard times. And we're going to remind each, remind each other when, when we think, I just don't know that I'm feeling it. Oh, man, but remember, God will never leave you nor forsake you. And if you desire him, you're going to eat well of the kingdom of God if you hunger after him. So let's just turn our hunger level up a little bit more. Let's turn our hunger for the world down, our hunger for God up. It goes on to say, you, you, Jesus gets a little bit more real than we're comfortable with. He says, oh, and when they persecute you, when they kick you, when they lie about you, and even if they kill you, you're blessed. Because the truth that's in you is too close for comfort in them. But you can count yourself blessed because all of the saints that have gone before you have been treated in this manner. Man, I'm not looking for the world to validate me with their approval. I'm looking for, I've already been validated. I have already been validated. You have already been validated by the King of kings and Lord of lords. Everybody else is lower than them. Any title that any man can give you is significantly lower than the title of son that's already been given to you by Jesus Christ. The title of righteous that's been given to you by the King of kings and Lord of lords. We stand in the victory of Christ.